Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Social Science and History Department, we welcome you to this evening's program. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to Lucy Rezar from the Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm a program coordinator at Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, and I wanted to thank you all for joining us tonight for this presentation. And thank you so much to Maria and the Free Library for hosting us tonight. Um, if you didn't already get the chance, there is a pre-presentation questionnaire in the chat. Um, and this filling this out really helps our funding and allows us to continue putting on free programming just like this one. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'll provide a brief introduction to PMC. Um, PMC is a nonpartisan nonprofit that envisions a Pennsylvania judicial system in which everyone is assured impartiality, fairness, accessibility, and respect. For over 30 years, PMC has, to work, has worked to educate all Pennsylvanians about our courts and how to navigate them with confidence. Um, and while we not be providing legal advice tonight, we hope that this presentation is an informative and educational experience for everyone here. And we are really honored to be joined tonight by Megan Watson. Megan is a top rated family law attorney and a partner at BKW Family Law, where she has amassed over 20 years of legal experience. Her work involves diverse, excuse me, divorce and custody mediation, as well as representation of survivors of domestic assault and child abuse in personal injury cases. We are extremely grateful to Megan for being here with us and sharing her extensive knowledge. Um, we hope you all enjoy and thank you again for tuning in. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will, I will try to answer them along the way, but also um, we will provide some time at the end for uh, further questions. Um, okay, so Luce, do you want to start with the courts, Lucy, or did you want to go back? Um, the rest was just an intro to PMC, so okay. I'm happy to turn it over to you. Okay, all right, all right. So um, the Pennsylvania court system, this uh, pyramid shows the, how the Pennsylvania court system works. Family court is in what's called the court of common pleas. Um, next, you can go to the next screen. And the court of common pleas um, includes both the trial division, which is the civil division that a lot of people hear of like personal injury cases, orphans court, which handles um, guardianship stuff and estate work. But family court is, is further broken down into two branches. We have the juvenile branch and we have the domestic relations branch. The juvenile branch is the branch that deals with um, things such as um, when children's aren't, children are in DHS, when there's truancy issues, or when um, children are, being, are involved in a criminal matter but not being charged as adults. Um, domestic relations is what we're here primarily to talk about. That is everything involving divorce, custody, support, and protection from abuse. Yep, that's what I just said. <laughs> okay, all right. So Family Court is located at 1501 Arch Street. Uh, we operate Monday through Friday, uh, eight to five. Um, there, here are contacts for you. The website is actually, um, it's been updated a few times. It's, it's pretty helpful. Um, there are documents actually on the website. If you are looking to file on your own, you can get access to documents um, and phone numbers and information. If for some reason, for example, you're running late to court and you need to call court um, to let them know that you're running late. All right, next screen. These are the topics we're going to talk about. I'm going to focus mostly on the, the first three. We'll briefly go through four the prime Primarily what I do are the for our domestic relations work, which are those first three items. Okay, so in Pennsylvania, we have two types of divorces in terms of reasons to get divorced. One is called a fault-based divorce and one is a no-fault-based divorce. So when you hear about people talking about, oh, he committed adultery, I'm going to seek a divorce on adultery, uh, he abandoned the marriage, he's incarcerated, those would be fault-based grounds to get divorced. And then we have two no-fault grounds for divorce, um, which is primarily how people proceed. It, fault divorce, proceeding to get a divorce on a fault-based ground, is expensive, 
it's timely and literally the only difference is when you get your divorce decree at the end of the whole thing it cites the statute it doesn't even say what it was so as lawyers um we advise our clients not to proceed under fault because it really makes no difference at the end of the day you're divorced and it you're divorced that's all you need to be um okay i think we talk about no fault in the next screen Yeah, as I said, um, so he, these are some, just quickly, these are some reasons for fault-based um, divorce. But I, in 24 uh, years of doing this, I think I have filed for fault once. And only that was to include it in the complaint, just because my client was absolutely insistent. She wanted to put in the complaint that he had committed adultery. But we also had included the no fake no fault grounds. And that's how we ended up proceeding. It's just too expensive and too timely to go under fault grounds. There are two no fault based, no fault um, divorces. One is mutual consent. So that is if both parties agree that they want to be divorced. So a, com a divorce complaint is filed. And if both parties agree they want to be divorced, 90 days after that complaint is served on the defendant, both parties can sign a document saying, yes, we agree to be divorced. We want to be divorced. There's a reason for us to be divorced. Um, and the parties can proceed from there to obtain their their divorce decree. If there are no economic issues, those are really the only paper you need in a divorce when there are no economic issues are the divorce complaint um, that should include both no fault grounds for divorce. Then upon the 90 days, both parties, the paperwork is going to be the affidavit of consent, which is that paperwork that says, yes, we we want to be divorced. Um, and again, these documents are available on both the AOPC website and should be available on the court website. And um, we have access to them as well if you need them. Um, so you would have your divorce complaint. You would have your affidavit that, bo that both parties would sign saying yes, that they agree to be divorced. And you have the, the final, this press be to transmit, which is a funny name, um, is the final paperwork that gets filed with the court to let the court know, yeah, we want to be divorced. This is the reason where we agree to be divorced. There's no economic issues. Please enter our divorce. I did forget one thing. The the plaintiff who files the complaint has to prove that the defendant proved that the defendant got the complaint. So there is a, a, a paperwork that the defendant can sign to say, yes, I got the complaint. So really it's very, it sounds simple because we are talking about literally four pieces of paper, um, but it's, Pennsylvania does not make it easy to get divorced without a lawyer. Um, so while it sounds easy because it's these paperwork, there are time periods and waiting periods. Um, so unfortunately, you will need some guidance if you are try if you are seeking to file a divorce on your own. Um, even just having a lawyer available for you to talk to, um, just to t walk through the paperwork, is is going to be helpful. The other no fault is when the parties have been separated for the requisite period of time. If for some reason you separated before 2016, you have to wait two years. Now, clearly it is 2024 and those two years have passed. For all people who separate post 2016, it's only a one year separation. You can be separated. Now, I, so the separation can be confusing to some people. They assume that that means that somebody has to move out and you're not living together, and but that's not necessarily true. You can be separated from your spouse and still in the same household. The question about separation, what raises separation is, have you informed, does the other spouse know that you want to get a divorce? And do other people around you know? Have you started telling your friends? Have you started living separate lives? Are you going out? Is one of you dating? Are people aware that you are separating and no longer considering yourself married? So that's how we determine what separation is. And, and the court recognizes that sometimes people cannot afford to live in two separate households, which is why we recognize that there is separation even within the same house. So establishing that date, you know, I, I have cases where the, the parties literally turn to each other and say, you know what, I'm done. I want to be divorced. And that's the day that we use. So once you can establish what that date is for this no fault um, divorce, 
that's when your one year starts running. So a year after that date, one party, and it only takes one party, can sign a document saying we have been separated for a year. And therefore, court, please acknowledge that we've been separated for a year and, and please proceed with a divorce, which you can do if there's no economic issues. Um, so both of these divorces, you can get done merely on paper, no hearing, as long as there are no economic issues. Oh, go back. Was there something before this? Sorry, we're... <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I think this is it. That's okay. It just went too fast. So as I said, it can be difficult to get divorced without an attorney, specifically if there are economic issues. So we, I, I mentioned how that it's a little easier if you're not seeking, if you don't have anything to divide. And by that, I mean, if there's a, a house that's, that was acquired during the marriage, even if not in both parties' names, if it was acquired during the marriage, it's marital. Title does not control in Pennsylvania, which is really important to note because a lot of people assume that because they're not, that a property is not jointly titled, it's not marital. But if it was purchased or acquired during the marriage, it is. Um, retirement. If there's a retirement account that was either started or contributed to during the marriage, there's a value to the marriage and what's in that retirement account. Bank accounts, investment accounts, uh, cars. So, if you have any of those economic issues, if you're seeking to split any of those assets or address any of those issues, the divorce is going to take much longer and you need to either reach that by agreement or that will require a hearing and you will have to go to court for a hearing. If there's no economic issues and you can do it all by paper, then you don't have to go to a hearing, but you do need to comply with the document requ requirements. Like there are, there's a 20 day waiting period um, when you're talking about filing that document that says you've been separated a year. So um, there, the, not to tout another nonprofit, but Philadelphia VIP has a guidebook on its website as well that can walk you through all those time periods. It's very helpful, uh, kind of prepared by my office. Um, <laughs> and so if you have questions on, okay, what needs a time period? What needs... What do I need to prove service for? There, there's very helpful uh, and useful information, and that's that's uh, phillyvip.org. Okay. Do we have any questions on divorce? I know that was super quick, and it can be very complicated. Um, if anyone has anything, you want to put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Moving on to support. Um, support is an overarching concept. There is support for both a spouse and for a child. Um, support of a spouse has three different, uh, you could file for support for a spouse under three different avenues. One is spousal support, one is alimony, and one is alimony pendente lite. Spouse, so a spouse has an obligation to support their dependent spouse or financially dependent spouse. And a party can file requesting for spousal support even if there is not a divorce filed. So if you are living with your spouse and they are withholding funds and they're not paying the bills and they're not meeting the financial needs of the household, you actually can file for spousal support and not file for divorce and get support from your spouse to help with those expenses. It does not happen often. Um, I think maybe I've seen it once. Um, but most people, if they're filing for spousal support, there's been a deterioration enough of the relationship that they are also filing for divorce. Alimony pendente lite is the Latin way of saying alimony during the pendency of the litigation. So that is, uh, is support that is granted to a spouse while a divorce is pending. It is a mathematical calculation. It is done on the computer. It's strictly based on percentages. It's based on incomes. And um, what the not, what the computer what the calculator says is what you get. Alimony is support that a spouse gets after the divorce is final. So if there is an agreement or a hearing that talks about how are we dividing our assets and should the dependent spouse receive alimony, 
it is at that point that there's a discussion about how much should the alimony be every month? How long does it go on? There are not set rules in Pennsylvania regarding alimony. There's no two for uh, two for one or three for one. I know that that's a common one. People say three years of one year of alimony for every three years of marriage. That, it, that does not exist. Um, it's completely based on the party's incomes and what their needs are. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Go ahead, next one. <laughs> so child support is, is support for the child. Um, this is not, um, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> if you have a child, the expectation is you are going to support your child. It is, it's the court, in the court's opinion, it's non-negotiable. Obviously parties can negotiate what they want to do with this, but if somebody files for support, for child support, as long as you have an income, you're going to be paying child support. That is also, it is based on what the party's net income is, how many children they have, the age of the kids, the custody schedule, how many, and by that, I mean the overnights. Overnights are what's relevant to the determination of child support. Can you go to the next screen? There is the um, Pennsylvania Supreme Court puts out and then updates every three or so years, a chart called the guidelines, which identifies when parents are making a combined total of X amount of dollars, they would be spending on basic needs this much money on their children. So it's broken down by one child, two child. I think it goes up to five or six children. And so it's, it's done by that calculator. And so what the court does or what your attorneys do, if you're um, negotiating, they put in both parties gross income. The computer does the calculation for what the taxes are to come up with net income. So for example, if you and your spouse are combining, are, are earning about $10,000 a month, then on that chart, two children is $2,044. So what that means is the court has determined if they were living together, this is how much we would be spending on two children's basic needs. Basic needs is housing, food, clothing, kind of the stuff that you think about the needs being like every day, like your normal stuff, not your extraordinary expenses, not activities, not health insurance, just your basic needs. And then that number, so the court says, okay, they'll, they would be spending about $2,044 out of their $10,000 on the, on the kids portions of those needs. If the parties <coughs> that then gets distributed between the parties in proportion to their net incomes. So if you're earning 25% of that, you're responsible for 25% of that cost and your spouse is responsible then for 75% of that cost. And whoever has the children the majority of the time, meaning more than 50% of overnights, the other spouse is will pay to them the child support. So that's how child support works. There, it, at 50-50, so at 40% of overnights, which is 142 overnights during the course of a year, that child support will start to reduce because the expectation is if you have your child in your home for that many or more overnights, you have some of your own expenses that you are paying for that child in your home. And so therefore the other spouse isn't, isn't paying for them as much. And so the child support gets reduced. At the time you get to 50-50, in most cases, not all cases, in a lot of cases, it, it usually evens out that somebody doesn't have to pay support. Now, the caveat to that being, if there's a huge discrepancy in income, you could still have 50% custody of your child and be paying child support to the other party. It really comes down to the disparity of the income. The guidelines on 50-50 cases really do try to get to equal income in both households so that equal amounts of money are being spent on the children when they are between two parents 50-50. Um, but again, with the discrepancy of income, that is not always necessarily possible. So there, so it is possible that you could have custody of your children 50% of the time and still paying child support to the other party. So what we what I've talked about so far is what's on the guidelines for basic needs. Um, the additional costs will would include 
child care necessary to work, which could be before school, after school, a nanny, a babysitter, um, summer camp. Um, also, what, what the additional things that get added in are uh, the cost of health insurance is an additional need that will get included. Um, sometimes it could be religious instruction if the parties agree. It could be sometimes activities if the parties agree. If there are disputes over this issue, unless there's a custody order addressing that, um, the court doesn't necess won't necessarily add in, for example, uh, soccer expense, right? Mom wants the kid to play soccer. Dad doesn't agree that the kid plays soccer. If they don't agree to it, it doesn't necessarily get added in. And so that would be paid on top of the basic support and in proportion to the party's incomes. So again, if we take that old, um, that example that I just talked about, if we have, for example, let's say before and after care at school, mom would be responsible for 25% under the calculator and dad would be responsible for 75% under the calculator. So if dad's the paying party, 75% of the cost of before and after care is going to get added back into, it's going to get added to the child support and mom will get a higher amount every month in child support. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is for the parties to agree that they're going to pay their percentages directly to the provider because that's possible too. But that would be by agreement. In general, the court likes to add everything into the into the calculation and do a wage attachment so that they know that one party is def is paying their support and, and it's being received by the other party. There's also a question about um, income. Should I take that now? Yeah, that's fine. So one of the so the question is about VA disability or other disability as income. It depends what kind of income. VA disability is considered income for child support calculation purposes. SSDI um, is considered income for child support purposes. SSI is not. So it depends which kind you're talking about. So the difference between SSDI and SSI, for those of you who don't know, SSDI is disability income that you receive from Social Security based on your earnings and your work history. SSI is that set amount that people get when they don't have enough work history to have earned points for SSDI. So like welfare is not income for support purposes and SSI is not, but the others, but SSDI and VA disability is. All right, so the way support works is if one party files a support complaint, gets filed at 1501, um, and an initial conference date is scheduled. At any point, I want to say, you can reach an agreement with the other side and file an agreement, and, um, and that will become a court order, uh, and just as binding as if you, consider, as if you continued through court. The first step is usually actually where that happens. So the first step is a conference between someone who's not a lawyer, they, they just work in the court system, sitting at their computer, gathering the information and putting the information into the computer and coming up with the and running the calculator and coming up with the number. Many cases settle at that level, especially like just basic W-2 cases, people, you know, who have, who their income isn't in question, they have set, you know, they have set income, they know what their expenses are. Um, and so it's actually really nice because the court can take care of all that and you run the numbers. And if you agree on the numbers and you agree on any extra expenses that go in, you can get a final order at that conference level um, and, and you're done with it. That, that's it. You're done. If there's no agreement reached at that level, if there's no order in place, typically the conference officer will at least put an order in place to run until you get to the next level, which is a hearing um, before, it's a record hearing before someone who's a lawyer. So it's someone who's acting as a judge. It's a hearing officer in support. Um, and that is your chance to give your evidence. You're not, you're, you have bring everything with you, all your exhibits, all your income information, all your receipts from your expenses that you want the court to consider, um, any information on if there's a dispute about how many overnights the child is, any documentation you have, a calendar you keep, whatever it is, that is your opportunity to present your case. You will not have another opportunity to do that. So testimony is taken. That's where you ask questions. That's where you have the ability to ask the other side's question. And that's where all the evidence is entered. After that hearing, a recommendation is issued by that hearing officer. 
if everybody agrees and nobody does anything, that recommendation will become the final support order. If somebody disagrees with it, they can file what's called exceptions, which is a document that gets filed with the court that says to the court, this is how the hearing officer screwed up, right? They messed up by not assigning someone an earning capacity. They messed up because they did my, they did the tax calculation wrong. What, whatever the reason, they messed up because they didn't include childcare. Um, so exceptions go to a judge, but the judge does not hear the case again. The judge is only there to say, yes, the hearing officer screwed up and you can go back to the hearing officer or no, the hearing officer didn't screw up and this is your order. They will not hear the case again. All right, anything on, else on support before we move on to custody? Okay. All right, custody. There are two types of custody, legal custody and physical custody. Legal custody is the right to like make major decisions for the child. Who gets to decide where the child goes to school? Who gets to decide what religion they're raised in? Do they get a specific surgery? Um, those kind of like big, big life issues. Not the daily, what's the child wearing? What are they eating? Th those kinds of daily decisions get made by the person whose home that child is in on that specific day. Um, a big one that comes up is phones, cell phones. I consider those a legal custody issue. Uh, when it, what is the right age to give your child a cell phone? Um, and so when we have legal custody, the, the forms of legal custody are either sole, which means one parent is making all the decisions or shared, which means both parties have to participate in those decisions. So if you have shared, which is the most common, it is very difficult to get sole legal custody. Um, that means that you better be talking to the other parent in terms of uh, where the child's going to school. If you wanna change schools, if you wanna enroll the child in counseling and therapy, that is a shared legal, that is a legal custody decision. If you wanna get a cell phone, those kinds of decisions have to be made jointly between the two parents. Physical custody is about where the child is physically on any given day. And in Pennsylvania, our, these are our four definition, definitions for the four different types of physical custody. So we have primary physical custody. That means where the child is more than 182 nights a year, right? More than 50% of the time. Partial is whoever has the, it would be having them less than 50% of the time. So they go hand in hand, right? One parent has primary, the other parent has partial. Then we have shared which is exactly 50% of the time, which could look a variety of different ways. It could be seven alternating weeks. It could be one parent has every Monday, Tuesday, one parent has every one, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the parties alternate weekends. I've seen some crazy ones where kids live six months in one place and six months in another place. I don't advise that, but that would be considered shared. So, um, and then we have visitation, which in our language is supervised. So visitation is used in Pennsylvania only for supervised custody. And so that means that one parent would have, actually what's missing in here is one parent would have sole physical custody, which means they have custody all the time. And the other parent only has visitation. So they would have supervised time, whether that's in a facility or whether that's being supervised by an agreed upon party. Um, and, and the supervision could be an hour or could be a day, but superv supervised custody is visitation. So with custody, with custody proceedings, again, it starts by filing a complaint. And once you file a complaint, a hearing is scheduled. And this time to compare it to the way it works in support is you don't have that initial level with a conference officer who's not a lawyer. Your first level here is with a, with a hearing officer who is a, who is a lawyer. They are able, they serve as mediators. They will try to help you reach an agreement. They can take testimony. What they cannot do is they cannot order 50, 50 custody and they cannot order permanently primary custody. They can, they're, they're not allowed to do that. Only judges can do that. They can enter any orders you want. And if the question is how much partial physical custody somebody gets, they can also issue, issue that order as well. Um, they're in Philadelphia, just because it takes so long to get to a judge, hearing officers will 
and have been recently entering temporary orders for custody at the hearing officer level, even if there's a dispute as to who has primary custody. And they're doing that under a term called exigent circumstances because it's considered exigent when you're going to have to wait six, nine months to get before a judge. They do not want there to be bouncing back and forth and literally pulling children apart because the parents can't come up with a custody arrangement. So at that, if a, so at that, at that level, a lot of cases end up settling or at least partially settling. I mean, you can, add, you can agree, okay, this person's going to have primary, this can, person's going to have partial, or we're going to do 50, 50. And you can leave some parts open that you don't agree with that the hearing officer can then issue a recommended order. If the recommended order is not, a, if no one files like in support for exceptions, that'll become the order. But if somebody files an objection to that recommended order, you'll go to a judge. The difference between custody and support is when you go to a judge, the judge can hear evidence. It's not just about whether the hearing officer messed up. The judge can hear all the evidence and all the testimony. I, the other, and I don't know if this is on the next screen. Yeah, so... Um, most hearings before the judge, unless you file a request otherwise, are really quick. I, I mean, you can walk in at a nine, a nine o'clock listing and there could be 10 cases on the list. And then there's another one o'clock listing. So it's not a lot of, you're not given a lot of time on these regular listings. If you know you need more time, if you know that you are going to have other witnesses, if you need a teacher to testify, if you need a doctor to testify, if there's there's some kind of special situation in your case, there are documents that you there's a document that you can file a motion. It's called and I, I might be skipping ahead, but it's called a motion for a protracted listing, a semi protracted or protracted. A semi protracted is asking the court to schedule you for a half day hearing. So that gives you three straight hours that you can present your case. A protracted is a full day. Right. So that's a nine to five listing. You have all day to present your evidence. So if you know that you're going to need that much time ahead of time, you want to file for that as soon as possible because those dates are really far out. And so what happens is if you wait till you get to your judge date, which you've now already waited six to nine months for, and then ask for a full day, you're going to be another potentially a year or more out before you get that day in court. So if you are aware, as soon as you are aware that you need longer time, you should be filing that motion. The other motions that you can file are, we have, we have um, emer an emergency petition. So an emergency is really an emergency. The kid is in absolute physical danger if the court doesn't do something now. That doesn't include withholding. It doesn't include, um, there's so many things it doesn't include. It really is just about the kid being in physical danger or like, you know, the parent, I, I've done ones where a parent got arrested. So I filed an emergency petition so that I could get an order right away, giving that parent who's not incarcerated. So, uh, so physical and legal custody. Um, so it really is stuff that comes down to this is emergency and has to be dealt with right away. Now there are issues that need to be dealt with more quickly than the six to nine months. It's going to take you to get in front of a judge. And in Philadelphia, we have a practice for that. It's called expedited petitions. So these are filed on Wednesdays and they're on a specific issue. So it could be, we don't ag agree on where the child's going to go to school. It could be, uh, we don't agree to if the child's going to get this certain medical issue or I need a passport because I'm going on a vacation and dad's refusing to sign the paperwork for a passport. So it's on a, on a one or two topic, very limited issue. It is not on, I, I need a custody order. In order to file an expedited petition, as I said, you have to file it on Wednesdays and there has to be an underlying petition. So there either has to be an open custody complaint or a petition to modify. It's, you can't just have the expedited petition. So judges are required under the state statute to consider 18 factors when they're making a custody determination. The factors are listed here. Um, and so when you are preparing your case or when you're thinking about, should I file a petition to modify? I really, I advise my clients take these 18 factors and sit down and think about it. Think about What's going on in your case? Where do these issues fit into these factors? How do they weigh? How do they weigh for you, for or against you? Um, 
And so uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but there was the first line and the next line are on the next screen. Oh, and I want to talk about something, uh, criminal charges. So in Pennsylvania, we now have a form that require, that you're required to fill out to identify if you or a household member have been convicted of a, or uh, charged with, a spe with certain specific crimes, not all of them, but with certain ones. And depending on, um, and it's you or a household member, and if you have been, the court has to make it a safety assessment before uh, granting custody. And that would go for either party. Um, most of them have to do with, um, and like, having to do with like endangering children or sexual assault or violence. Um, but that is an additional required form um, that must get filed with all custody complaints. All right. Any questions on custody before we go on? Okay. So the primary work that I do is domestic relations, which you can probably tell because I talk really fast about it and can do it in my sleep. Um, dependency work. I do the work I do in dependency is I represent kids through a, another nonprofit organization called Support Center for Child Advocates. So I, in dependency court, unlike custody court, um, children are granted representation. So again, unlike custody court, parents and children both get assigned counsel in dependency court. There's a right to counsel. You can go to the next screen. So um, most, so dependency court will include uh, any cases where children are being, um, have come into the DHS system for, for uh, any, I'm trying to think how to break this down. There's two different types. Um, I don't want to get too deep into it. But if a child is determined that the parents aren't adequately caring for that child, the, the, the child can be brought in the dependency court system and DHS can file a petition asking for them to be declared dependent under the statute. And that, then they are then under the care of DHS. Sometimes that means removal from the parent's home. It doesn't necessarily have to mean removal from a parent's home. But if declared dependent, then DHS is, continues to be involved in the child's life and will be involved with the family, provide services, I mean, DHS or their um, or the other agencies that work with DHS. The your DHS is required to show by clear and convincing evidence that a child is dependent. Is dependent. Dependency court is really lax. It's um, <laughs> while you know the rules of evidence are supposed to apply. I have they don't. I don't even. Well, I won't say that because this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> so it the it's there's a lot of people on every case so as i said both parents have a right to counsel the child has a right to counsel there is a lawyer for the city there is there are the social workers so when you walk into a dependency courtroom there are at least there are typically at least six people who are up at the at the um at the desks facing the judge and then you have the judge and all the tip stuff so um and the other thing about dependency court is you're there a lot. So the statute requires regular updates. So every three months, a dependency case gets relisted. I don't know if that's on the next one. So if you have a child who is in the, in dependent, has been declared dependent, you will be back in court regularly because the court is required to follow up. The, the reason they say that they do that is the intent of the statute is that the child, assuming it's been taken from the home, um, the intent is that the child be reconciled and returned to the home as soon as possible. That really is the stated goal of the statute. Um, it certainly, if you are involved in dependency, may not feel that way because it could take years for you to get your child back. So um, a lot of parents get very, um, uh, upset by the length of time and how long it takes to, to resolve the issue and, and get their kids back. Most often you are not actually in front of a judge. I mean, there are judges that fit on, that sit on dependency. Many times you're in front of a hearing officer who is doing those three month reviews. Um, but at any time, just know that you can ask for a judge um, and the court has to give you a judge. They cannot deny you the right to appear in front of a judge.
Um, I think I kind of already talked about this. Yeah, so, I, and actually, I'm going to, something I saw. So, DHS, so like I said, DHS may or may not remove the child from the home. They will provide services. So, um, they can provide therapy services. They can provide help with educational services. I mean, I have found there are cases that I've had where I found DHS actually to be very helpful in cases because I've represented kids, for example, with special needs. And DHS has um, some really good uh people that can work with education and have have and helped me help my client my child client in getting what he needed for a, a good school fit um services an iep in place like those kinds of things so there are um dhs does have if you happen to be involved in dhs does have uh, services available to them quite frankly that i wish we could get in custody cases i've had these conversations with judges that if we could get the same kind of assistance on custody cases we it would be it would be amazing because there are kids over in custody who are with their families but those families also need some of that help but we can't we can't get it on that side it's like two different worlds between dependency and family court um so if a child though is removed from a home then DHS is supposed to make a permanency plan. Reunification is the stated goal of the statute. However, um, other other plans could include adoption, um, could include permanent legal custody, which is someone taking permanent custody of a child, but not the next step of adoption. It could be living with a family or relative. Um, if they're over the age of 16, uh, DHS, and again, this is something that has been really helpful for, for older kids, will help kids transition to being able to take care of themselves. So APLA, this another plan permanent living arrangement, gives them the skills that they need that they can start living on their own um, and they kind of build up to it. And actually, if you are in DHS at the age of 18, you can choose to stay in DHS and they will help the child with college expenses, education, post-secondary education expenses, living expenses. So if I have a kid who's 18 and about to age out, I always suggest that they stay in the system because, I mean, again, like my kids, you know, kids who aren't in the system don't have that unless they have the parents to provide that for them. And this is a great resource for older kids. Okay, parents have the right to counsel, have a right to be notified of all court dates and get copies of all motions and decisions. They have a right to be heard. They have a right to introduce evidence. They have a right to ask questions of the other parties. They can appeal a final order. Um, again, I'm gonna say again, you have a right to a judge. So if you're in front of a hearing officer, you absolutely have the right to ask to be in front of a judge and the court cannot deny you that right. Okay. Wow. We got that in. It's 644. <laughs> okay. Here are um, PMC's uh, sites, social media. <laughs> if you want to go there, I know I mentioned a few others, uh, Philly VIP being one of them, uh, Support Center for Child Advocates being another one. They are also a really good resource if you, if there's a child in the system and you have questions. Um, all right. Lucy, did you want to say anything before I see if there are questions? Nope. You did an amazing job. Thank you so much. I, I talked really fast and I know I, I recognize that. So anything that anyone wants me to go back over, any specific questions you may have, um, I think we can, I don't, if we can change the view, people could either raise their hand or um, put it in the chat. Also, I just wanted to add um, that these slides will be sent out to everyone. So you'll have all that information um, that you can return to. And there was um, a question in the chat. Oh, is there just... What to do if there's a flight risk? What to do if there's a flight... Okay, so I would have to hammer down on that a little bit more. Um, so if the concern is that a parent is going to take a child and run to another country or another state, um, if they're, so if it's another country, and if you're really confident that that's going to happen, um, then you certainly, there are means to contact the state department 
um, to so that the child's passport gets flagged so that you can avoid, um, hopefully, they get, they get caught at the airport um, so that they're not allowed to travel. If you're asking about the ability to file an emergency petition, I would say in that case, you have to have really definitive proof that a parent is intending to, to flee with a child. Um, otherwise, if you're concerned about that, you could try filing an expedited if there's already an underlying petition um, and ask for the passport or ask for an order requiring the child to remain in Pennsylvania or in the Philadelphia area. Um, and should the child be removed, notice having to be given. Um, but it really kind of depends on this, uh, the specifics of the case. I hope that helped. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so, so much, Megan. We really appreciate your time. And thank you to Maria for having us again. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye.